Come on the heart. Last you had it already? Oh, electric? Yeah. yeah. When? For the heart? Yeah. A lot of people have it right around now. I have my muscle yeah. test tomorrow. We have heart. But muscle and heart. Muscle and heart, right? Muscle and heart, right? No. Mm -hmm. Muscle and heart, right? When is it tomorrow? Wednesday? Wednesday. Okay, now. Um, so you should know your anatomy. Spend time reviewing your anatomy here. And then, um, so that means that second test is very, very easy, right? Because it's like stuff you were tested on already. Matter of fact, I told them I want to change it to three tests because the second test is way too easy. It's a waste of time. Such a waste of time, the second test in AP2 lab. It's, it's um, muscle, it's like the heart, and like, I don't know, a couple blood vessels or something. It's like the easiest test in the world. Okay? So, and it's just a waste of time you even set it up. So now, it's in three weeks. Now, what happens is, um, okay, I mean, look what's on it, it's so easy. Is it blood and the heart? Yeah, it's the heart and blood. What so about those, right? Yeah, it's, just, it's the easiest test. Anyone that get, doesn't get 100 on the next test should go home and tell mom that, forget about being a clinician. That's the easiest test you'll ever see. Okay, so now, tell mom that's not going to happen. Okay, now, anyway, so here it is, the heart. Too bad. I mean, you know what? The wimpiness has got to stop. I can't stand it anymore. The self-empowering wimpiness is making my stomach bleed every day. Okay, now, now, anyway, so now, babies. Just want to walk around all day and go, baby, and walk away from it. Anyway, so now, so here, so start learning the heart, okay? Can I record it? Sure. You can record. Okay, now you start learning the heart. Now, you're going to have the, the model here, right? Now, all you got to do is I'm just going to tell you two things, and then you're going to take it from there. Anterior, posterior. Okay? How do you know posterior? Because there's a big red, big blue vein back there. Okay? Anterior, coronary arteries. Posterior, coronary sinus. So the main vein is posterior, the main arteries are anterior. That's it. Sternocostal surface, posterior surface. Okay? Now, what you're going to do is the heart is tipped. It's like this, really, in the chest, right? Okay? So most of the anterior sternocostal surface of the heart is always going to be right. Correct? And the whole, most of posterior is going to be left because the heart is turned like that, really, when you look at it, right? This is posterior and this is anterior. Now, what happens is, to confirm that, you look inside and you check the, the vessels. And you check the valves. Okay? You have this, this vessel right here. What's that one? Um, no. Pulmonary? Pulmonary trunk. Called pulmonary vein. This is pulmonary artery, actually, a pulmonary trunk. Okay? This one right here. Pulmonary trunk or pulmonary artery. You know what a trunk is, right? It's a big, short vein. Actually, big, short artery. I'm sorry. Okay? Right? That means you have this valve. That means this has to be pulmonary semilunar valve. Right? And that means this has to be right ventricle and AR in the front. You see? Okay? That's how you do it. And then you go over to the left. This has to be left. That means if this is left, that means this has to, be, this has to be aorta over here. And you have aorta right here. Okay? You have your order going up. Okay? Now, posterior wood is going to be all the veins. Okay? Now, these are the pulmonary veins, right? Okay? Now, this brings up a very important anatomical point. Okay? Pulmonary veins, these are called pulmonary veins because they enter the heart. Okay? A vein delivers blood to the heart. Doesn't care. Doesn't matter if it's oxygen or not oxygen. It doesn't matter. That's not the anatomical definition of a vein. The anatomical definition of a vein is it goes towards the heart. Most of the time, they're deoxygenated. But these are not. This is the most oxygenated blood in the whole body, right? Because it's coming from the lungs. Okay? And this is a pulmonary artery. Okay? A pulmonary trunk. The most deoxygenated blood in the whole body. It's an artery, though. Because it's leaving the heart. Okay? Good? And then that, from there, then you learn everything else. So now you know the basic stuff and you go. Now, if you understand your valves, 
Do you all guys understand the function of the valves? How they work? You had that in lecture? Right? Everyone's had that in lecture? Everyone understands the function. Okay. Semilunar valves are turnstiles. Right? You have to push on them. Correct? During systole, the blood pushes on the valve, it opens the valve, and the blood moves through into the vessel, into the aorta or pulmonary, into the aorta or the pulmonary um, trunk, right? Now, okay, now, so you have the pulmonary system, right side, going through the lungs, pulmonary semilunar valve. Then you have the aortic semilunar valve on the left, right? From the left ventricle to the left, to the aorta, right? The semilunar valve, everyone knows what I'm talking about when I say a turnstile, right? It only moves when you push on it, right? That's how it works. Systole drives up the pressure, and you get the stroke volume because the pressure behind the valve pushes it open, right? You have isovolumic contraction, which pushes on the valve, which is open the valve, and the blood flows out. Same on the right and left. Okay? Now, the other one is the atrioventricular valves, AV valves, right? Right and left. Okay? Right AV, left AV. Now, the, now these are not pressurized valves, right? They just flow. So as soon as the pressure drops, and the papillary muscles stop contracting and the heart stops contracting, you get a vacuum pressure which pulls it open, right? Right? The cardiac siphon. Does everyone understand the cardiac siphon? Very, very important concept. Did you hear about it before? Okay. You have dial we have systole, right? It ends. When systole ends, okay, at the very end of systole, you have empty ventricles, right? and blood is flowing forward in the atrium, in, in, the, in the arterial system, correct? Now, at that very second, you basically have a vacuum in here, right? You have closed valves, most of the blood, almost all of the blood is left, right? And you have an open vacuum in the ventricles. At that second, boom, what does the vacuum do? It pulls, right? It's a siphon, it pulls. So it starts pulling venous blood from the body and from the pulmonary system. See, on the left, that's how the, and then left and on the right, that's how the, the blood gets back to the heart, right? So all the real force is on the left side, right? So now what happens is, now the venous blood is getting pulled into the vena cava, right? From above and below, mostly from below, because above is all gravity. So now you have this suction, it's pulling all the venous blood up to the heart, right? It's called the cardiac siphon. That is how the heart fills. It's all passive. Okay? It's a siphon effect. That's most of the filling of the heart, especially at rest. Okay? That's why it's a problem if a person doesn't move around. Right? Because the cardiac output drops because the stroke volume drops, and therefore the, the siphon effect is less and that means the veins don't drain out. They don't get siphoned. That's why you make a person move around even though they don't want to. Too bad you make them. Okay? Got it? Okay. That's how you keep people alive. It's real simple. Making them move around. Okay? All the congestive heart failure that we have, a lot of it has been avoided by good care by manual manipulation and movement of patients that can't move themselves. Okay? Okay, good. Very good. Now, um, <coughs> now the left ventricle now is filling with blood. Come through the atrium, it's filling. And so is the right. Okay, it's filling and filling and filling. <coughs> now, as it fills, it stretches, right? The wall stretch. Now, diastole ends. What's the first thing that happens? The atrial systole compresses the blood into the, into the ventricle, right? It's all passive. The only thing you're getting is a little 
takes a little traction out of the blood. It takes a little traction out, and the blood fills. And now, now what happens is you get the traction out. Now it starts to push up against the walls. So when it pushes up against the walls, it also pushes up on the valves, right? It's like squeezing a tube. You push on the bottom, it goes up, right? So it closes the valve. Now, now the valve's closed. They're hanging down, boom, they close, right? Now, the ventricle starts to contract. The ventricle starts to contract. It pushes up on the, on the, the valve, right? Now, it's also pushing on the semilunar valve, too. But you have iso you're in the isovolumic phase. The pressure is pushing on both valves. These are resisting any motion, right? Because the papillary muscles in the chordae tendini, next week when you get dissect the, um, the sheep part, you have to look for them. Very good. Chordae tendini, they're really, really amazing structures. They go from the papillary muscle to the edges of the valve cusps, right? So when they pull, when the valve cusps close, they act like parachute strings and they pull down. The blood's pushing up, right? Like each one of those little ceiling sections is like a valve. Just think you push up on it. And then you're pulling down from the inside, right? I'm pushing down, pulling down from the inside, and somebody's pushing up, right? That means it stays closed, okay? And then, and then, and then, systole can proceed. The pressure builds up enough to push open the semilunar valve. And that's when you get the ejection. That's the stroke volume. Okay, right? Now, stroke volume is the amount of blood that leaves in one beat, right? It is proportional to the end diastolic volume, which is the amount of blood that fills during diastole, right? So you have the EDV, which is a certain amount of, let's say, one liter, let's say, right? 1.5 liters, whatever it is. That's the passive filling from the from the from the siphon of the last side, last cycle, right? You have the siphon effect of the last cycle, which is pulling the blood. You see? And that's what sets up the stroke volume for the next one. It's how well, how efficiently did the heart move the last time. That's the point. Okay? So the end diastolic volume is how much it fills. The stroke volume is how much leaves. It's proportional. It should be very close. Right? In a healthy heart, there should be very little blood laying around in the ventricles after systole ends. What do you call that when you have blood laying around in the ventricle after systole ends? Okay. What do you call it? What? What? After end diastolic and systolic volume, also known as afterload. Well, it's my opinion, and a lot of people argue with me about that, it's my opinion that a large afterload is actually a pathology. Okay? A healthy heart will never do that. Okay? Okay. So, and that's actually what cardi I'm sorry, that's what cardi actually is, a cardi cardiologist is actually looking for when he measure those volumes. They don't want any afterload. Obviously, if you have a chamber that doesn't empty out all the way, you have less siphon force. You have less siphon force, you have less diastolic um, venous return, right? Less venous return, less stretch. Less stretch, less compliance. Less force, less stroke volume. You do that a couple times, and it gets worse and worse.